Hey guys, it's Katie. Welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about writing and editing. I've gotten a lot of requests in the past couple of months to talk more about my editing process, things that I look for when I'm doing beta reads and that kind of stuff. So I thought this video would be a good jumping off point. And if you want to see some more videos about editing, give this video a thumbs up so I know and maybe leave a comment down below with particular topics you'd like me to go into. But if you're new here or if you don't know, hi, my name's Katie and I work as a freelance editor and writer. So today I wanted to talk about some of the most common mistakes that I see in manuscripts and just the things that I comment on the most often. And I want to make it clear, I'm not calling out any particular client or manuscript that I've seen in the past because I mean it when I say these are very common mistakes which if anything I feel like should make you feel better <laughs> if you're a writer knowing that you're not alone in making these mistakes almost every writer makes these until they learn not to so I broke it down into the top nine most common issues that I see in manuscripts although a lot of them have little like sub points in there as well I have detailed notes I am prepared for this today and hopefully this video will be helpful or interesting to you guys I think a fitting first point here is beginnings now I have a ton of sympathy for writers on this one as I'm also a writer beginnings are hard to nail because you have a million different moving parts that you need to balance but some of the most common issues that I see with beginnings is number one did the story start in the right place this can be really hard I've read some books that were super interesting but as they started going into all of this backstory and things that had happened in the past the backstory was more interesting than the present timeline and it really made me wonder are you starting your story in the right place like if you're having to convey all of this backstory for like half of your book like there's so much to go into maybe you need a book before this one now that's an extreme case sometimes it's just as simple as your opening scene isn't super attention grabbing and we need something with a little more agency. Or on the opposite side of the spectrum, if you're trying to write your book like an action movie and you jump straight into a car chase and we don't know who your characters are and we don't care about them yet, that's also not a super effective opening because you're just throwing the reader into this action-packed scene, which actually isn't very exciting for the reader if they don't care about your characters yet. Another major issue that I see with beginnings is overwhelming the reader with way too much information. If you have too many characters in the first scene and you're throwing a dozen new names at the reader and you're trying to cram in backstory and world building and there's just so much information that the reader is struggling to stay caught up, that can be a problem. And then on the flip side, if you don't have enough context and you just throw the reader into a scene and they're just completely lost, you could lose them that way as well. Now there's something to be said for having, you know, some questions left unanswered in the first scene. You can definitely do that and you definitely should do that. But when you have too many questions in the first chapter, you're just making your readers more confused than they need to be. Like if I don't know who this character is, I don't understand the relationships of the other characters in the scene. I don't understand the world yet. I don't understand where they are or why they're there or what they're doing or what's happening. It's just too many questions. I just need like a little bit of a rope. I need some kind of foundation to help me get my footing in the scene. And then I'll be intrigued by the rest of the questions instead of just frustrated because I don't know anything. You gotta give the reader something to hold on to. Common problem number two, dialogue. I have a lot of different points to make within this one. For one thing, overly long monologues. The biggest thing that you should be thinking about with dialogue is does it sound authentic? Does it sound natural? Does it mimic natural speech patterns? And if you're not sure, just pay attention to the people around you for 24 hours and how people speak to each other. They're often not going off in two page long monologues every time that they're speaking. People don't typically speak for really long periods of time, especially not with like perfect grammar and well thought out structure. Like people don't just spout off speeches all the time. But then also people don't often say exactly what they're thinking or exactly what they're feeling. A lot of times people say the opposite of what they're thinking or what they're feeling or they'll just say what they're feeling in an indirect way. So having characters who are too straightforward who will just be totally straight and honest with everyone they come in contact with that might work for one character if that's their personality and they're just super honest and super blunt but having all of your characters just say exactly what they're thinking and exactly what they're feeling all the time People don't tend to do that. Going back to the overly long monologues, I also see a lot of, there's a couple of different interchangeable terms for this, white room syndrome, floating head syndrome, where it's just these long blocks of dialogue and we can't picture the room that the characters are in. We can't really picture the characters. We're not getting any character action, so we don't know what they're doing while they're speaking. You know, are they pacing? Are they messing with their hands? Are they running their hands through their hair? Like, 
What are they doing while they're speaking? And also, where are they? How are they saying it? What do they look like? Like we need more than just what they're saying on the page. And a good rule of thumb also is to look at your page and something I've suggested for a lot of my authors is for an exercise, try highlighting the different parts of your story, like your dialogues in blue and the descriptions in red or something like that. And just looking visually at the balance that you have on the page. Like zoom out on words, you can like see a bunch of different pages and see, is it all blue? Is it all red? Like you want a balance of both. Now, don't just look at like a sample of a couple of pages because this will differ depending on what's happening in a scene. Some scenes have more dialogue than others, but if you see a trend in your manuscript where you just have a ton of dialogue and no descriptions, just be aware that you might wanna work on balancing that out a little bit. And then a big one actually, is trying to convey all of your backstory and your world building via dialogue. Frankly, this kind of just comes off as a lazy writing technique and convenient if you just have your character sitting around and telling each other their life stories and telling you everything that you need to know about the world. For one thing, it usually comes across as kind of odd because, you know, we don't sit around discussing how our world works unless you have, you know, a character who's just come into this new world and doesn't understand anything yet and you have someone explaining it to them. We live here, we know how it works, so we don't go on talking about it. So it's not a very effective way to explain your world. It's also just not very interesting. Something that's kind of hard to grasp when you first get into writing is just because something might happen like that in real life doesn't mean it's an interesting scene to read on the page. Like you might have characters just sitting around talking about their life stories for 10 pages and they might do that in real life life, but it's not a very interesting scene. There's nothing happening in it aside from your characters talking to each other. And if that's a trend and that's all you're doing for the whole book and that's the only way that you're able to convey your backstory and your world building, it's not very interesting for the reader. And it just comes across as being a convenient way to give this information. My next comment is on pacing. There's a million different things that can go into having a pacing problem, but a big problem that I see pretty often, and it's a dead giveaway, is looking at the types of scenes that get more page time. And it makes it clear what scenes the author likes to write. Like you can totally tell when authors have a preference of writing a certain kind of scene. For example, if there's a writer who really loves writing action scenes, the chapters that have action scenes in them are like 25 pages long super in-depth, we get every detail, very fleshed out. And then we get to like a quieter scene and it's like two pages long, it's sped through, it's glossed over, the writer clearly doesn't enjoy writing that kind of scene. This is an issue with the pacing and also with character development because oftentimes those quieter scenes are really when we get to see character development. Just be wary, it's again a balanced game. Just pay attention to how much page time you're giving to these different kinds of scenes. And if you're focusing on one thing too much and just kind of looking over a different kind of scene that you might just not enjoy writing as much, but you still have to write it. Number four, sort of in a similar vein, as having characters who all sound the same. This is an assumption on my part, but I often chalk this up to it being the writer's sense of humor or the writer's personality. So for example, if all of your characters are super snarky and super sarcastic and they make a joke out of every situation, they're always joking around, they never take anything seriously, all of your characters sound the same. Now this can work if that's special to one character's personality, but if all of your characters react to situations the same way and they're always making jokes or whatever personality it may be, you can kind of tell that it's the writer's voice coming through all of these different characters instead of the characters having unique voices of their own. Similar to that point, my next one is being melodramatic. Now this can show its head in a lot of different ways and it sounds like worse than what I mean. It kind of sounds like an insult, like you're being melodramatic. But the way I think of it is sort of the difference between acting if you're a theater actor and you're on the stage and acting on film. So in theater, you have to be super expressive, all of these big movements, you have to be really dramatic for people to see you on the stage. But in film, if you're acting like that, it looks over the top. So sometimes having characters who react really strongly to things, they're gasping and they're screaming or they always wanna throw a punch, it just comes across as like a bit much. And this can even go back to having characters saying exactly what they're thinking or exactly what they're feeling. It can just feel a little over dramatic because people often aren't that transparent. And I usually see this the most often with the bad guys or the villains with characters who are just so obviously evil, it's like in your face. Like they're 
cussing every other word and they're threatening people every other word and they're throwing punches and they're really aggressive and they're saying all of these shocking horrible things and sometimes subtlety can go a long way with your villains especially when someone's acting like crazy all the time nothing they do ever surprises you because they're always punching someone or they're always killing someone so like oh yeah there he goes again but when you don't know what a character is going to do that's sometimes even scarier and then you know obviously you also want to make your characters well-rounded and there should be more than one side to your villain other than them just being like this evil person otherwise they're gonna be you know a flat evil character instead of a character. Next on my list I have overwriting slash newbie writer mistakes. These are super easy to fix and oftentimes I don't even comment on them in the manuscripts that I see just because this is more of an editing thing. Just be careful about being super repetitive in your writing and this is something that I think a lot of people don't realize that you don't have to say the same thing twice for it to be repetitive. If you say something in a couple of different ways it's still repetitive or if you show something and then say it it's repetitive. For example, if you say he was embarrassed and he wanted to crawl under a rock. He wanted to crawl under a rock already illustrates to us that he's embarrassed so you don't need to explicitly say he was embarrassed. Or even something as simple as he reached out an arm to grab. You could just say he grabbed. We can infer that he's reaching out an arm unless it's very important that we know it's this arm that is reaching out. So it's things like that. Or another really common thing is someone will say something in dialogue that's like clearly very snarky or they're struggling to say something so they use like ellipses or something in there and so we can see through the dialogue that they're struggling or that they're angry or something. So you don't have to say after the dialogue he struggled to say or he said angrily. Like we can infer that from the dialogue. Always assume that your reader is smart enough to see these little hints that you put between the lines. You do not need to explicitly say everything. Your reader is smart. They will pick up on things. Another thing is just like overly descriptive dialogue tags and also trying to cram way too many things into a single sentence. This could be like a bunch of different actions, just having a really long sentence in general with a bunch of different clauses. If you have like four different things happening in one sentence, your reader is gonna have to read it like several times for one thing because they're just trying to figure out what's happening. There's just too much. Just simplify it. <laughs> just cut it into a couple of different sentences. Of course you want a very sentence structure. This is getting into copy editing and line editing things, but don't make your sentences work too hard. If there's too many things happening in them, it just ends up being confusing and then the reader stops and it ruins the flow of your story and it ruins the pacing of your story and everyone's just tripping over overly complicated sentences. Another issue I see a lot is consistency. This is another editing thing. Characters who are inconsistent or world building that's inconsistent, for example, if it's like a paranormal romance and you have vampires in this world and you say at the beginning that no one knows about the vampires they have to hide and then later on you say there's this whole subdivision of this company that helps with the vampire customers like something doesn't add up there because at first you said the world doesn't know about them and now you're saying the world is accommodating them things like that and then passage of time i don't know why this has been an issue with a lot of the books that i've read lately is it's very unclear what their timeline is and what the passage of time is and it's particularly a problem if you do specify it but you specify it too late so you say blah 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 it's been about nine months and the reader's like hold on i thought it had been two days like if it was not clear that that much time has passed and then you specify it's very jarring now sometimes an easy fix for this is just including a timestamp at the start of your chapter like with the chapter heading or just specifying early on in the chapter that this much time has passed especially if you're jumping around a lot and it's not clear and then my last note isn't actually about writing or anything like that it's just a note in general if you are looking for feedback on your own writing is not actually being receptive to feedback now this is something again i have full sympathy for getting feedback on your writing can be very difficult if you're not used to it and even if you are Still nobody likes to hear someone criticize their writing no matter how constructive it is. And this isn't something that I experience very often but it does happen where you have writers who are seeking out a beta reader or an editor. What they really want is more of validation and they want you to tell them that it's great as it is and move forward. They basically just want you to give them the thumbs up and I feel like I'm doing a disservice to you if I'm not honest and pointing out the flaws with it now before you publish it because either I'm gonna tell you now or your reviewers are gonna tell you later. So if you are looking to seek feedback, just realize that no 
beta reader, editor, whoever you're working with is giving you feedback for any reason other than to help you. No one sees my editorial letters other than my clients. Like no one else is gonna see this feedback. I'm not writing it for anyone but that writer. So just know that the feedback, it's really just there to help you and try to look at it from someone else's point of view. If someone is telling you, I am confused at this part, you can't just be like, oh, they just don't get it. Clearly you didn't do your job as a writer and you didn't set it up and your readers are confused and you don't have to take their suggestion on how to fix that, but you have to figure out a way to fix it on your own. Another thing that I always specify in my letters is writing is incredibly subjective. These are just my opinions and my suggestions and you know you're writing better than anybody else. You know the story better than anybody else. So if there are any notes they don't click with your story, then ignore them. But if you are getting feedback on your story, I recommend sitting with it before making any changes or yelling at your beta reader and telling them that they're wrong. Sit with it, sleep with it 24, 48 hours and think about it and mull over the suggestions that you get because your beta readers and your editors are human too and they're not always right and you don't have to take every suggestion that people give you. But I can promise you, no matter who you are, your writing is not perfect and there is something that can be improved. So that's gonna be it for today's video. Those are the most common mistakes or trends that I see in the manuscripts that I beta read. If you'd like to see more videos on editing and writing, feel free to let me know down in the comments. If you're looking for a beta reader or an editor, I'll have my freelance services linked down below. I would love to work with you. Feel free to email me. And I hope you guys are having an awesome day. If you're new here, I would love it if you would subscribe and stick around. I put up at least two to three new videos every single week. If you like this video, I'd appreciate it if you would give it a thumbs up because it helps out my channel a lot and all of my links are down below in the description if you want to come follow me elsewhere but other than that i think i'll just see you guys in my next video very very soon bye so hit me so hit me so hit me first a confession you, I feel a connection with